review of a book um, entitled Land, How the Hunger for Ownership Has Shaped Our Modern World. And uh, in this book by Simon, uh, Simon Winchester, it examines the depth of how we acquire land, how we steward it, how we fight and why we fight over it. And, and finally, how on occasion we come to share it. And the reviewers of the book said that ultimately in this book, Simon Winchester is confronting the a central question of who actually owns the world's land and why does it matter? We are a nation uh, that at best, we have an inconsistent story regarding who comes to these uh, shores from other nations. At worst, we have a very selective memory and a selective practice of, of storytelling um, of, of regarding persons who are indigenous to this land and uh, have forgotten uh, that most of us um, have come to this land as immigrants. Uh, globally, we look at how and, and, and why certain borders are secured, so to speak, uh, and, and how they're secured. Who's on one line, who's on one side of that border versus who's on the other. There's a famous line from the play uh, Hamilton that says, uh, we're immigrants, we get the job done. So regardless of how you're coming to this table and, and why and, and the work that you're doing uh, within immigration reform, ultimately work that we're doing to help us be better neighbors to one another. Uh, I'm glad that you're here. And I look forward to, in a moment, introducing you uh, to three colleagues who are uh, seeking to uh, make the world and our communities uh, more hospitable and are really going to lead us in this conversation. Before I introduce them to you, I want to invite uh, Rotang Ashante uh, to, uh, to offer a prayer. Rotangi, please begin. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to sh um, share a prayer with you that I found on the Social Justice Center that I thought captures very well the uh, theme for today. Let us pray. God of mercy, help us to remember our, our, that our ancestors came across the seas. Help us keep in mind those who came long ago and those who now come to our shores. As we face you in prayer, God of compassion, we remember our country's words, send them back or stop the boats. Then we fear not your anger, but the steady glare gaze of boundless love and unlimited compassion that impel us to hear Jesus' command, love one another as I have loved you. Daring to step into such relationship, we pray for those forced to leave family, home, and all they hold dear. May they find safe passage and helping hands. And we also pray for those who have not found safe passage, remembering especially the 50 migrants who were found dead in, a, in the truck in the border of US-Mexico border this week. We remember them and their families. We pray for an end to the wars and oppression that forced them to leave. We pray for those who welcome them, are blessed in abundance. And with deep humility and a heart hungry for justice, we pray for us Americans, citizens and leaders. Open our eyes, our minds and our hearts that we may see, understand, and welcome our brothers and sisters. May our change of heart penetrate to our beginning as strangers in this land. May we allow those we displaced, the first people of this land, to welcome us. Then knowing in humility what it is to be welcomed, we will know how to welcome the strangers who come to our shores. This we ask in the name of Jesus, your son, in whom we no longer 
we are no longer strangers. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Reverend Rotangi. And indeed, even as you were praying, it is that passage in Ephesians that says that uh, Jesus is the one who came to break the dividing wall of hostility uh, between us and how quickly um, too many um, are eager uh, to reconstruct um, those walls. Uh, as I'm preparing to in, in, uh, introduce uh, three persons, again, just to, uh, for those who may be, this may be your first time participating in a justice dialogue, it really is intended to be a conversation. We invite uh, your comments and, and your questions, um, your reflections on what you hear one another say. Uh, as much as possible, we'd love for you to come off of, of mute um, and offer those words. And you are also welcome to use um, the chat feature. Uh, there will be times where uh, persons are encouraged to put in the chat uh, different resources. So we have those um, as, as references. So again, comments and questions are, are, are welcome um, in, in this forum. And so uh, I'll, I'll continue by introducing uh, three persons who are part of the dialogue today in uh, the names of uh, Reverend Carlos Malave, uh, Myra uh, Dalkeba, and uh, Reverend Peter Carmen. So <laughs> Reverend uh, Carlos Malave is the president of the Latino Christian National Network. Uh, it is the broadest Christian Latino network in our nation, including Pentecostal, evangelical, mainline and Catholic leaders. From 2012 to 2021, Reverend Malave served as the executive director of Christian Churches Together in the USA. It is an ecumenical table inclusive of our uh, country's major Christian traditions. In this position, he regularly worked with the senior leaders of more than 30 Christian denominations and organizations. He has served for many years on the steering committee of the Circle of Protection a hunger advocacy group of more than 50 denominations and Christian organizations. And before serving with Christian churches together, he worked for 10 years as an associate for ecumenical relations at the office of the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church. And in that capacity, he traveled widely throughout the world representing the Presbyterian Churches USA. Reverend Malave began his ministry in Puerto Rico and served as pastor for several years in Southern California. He, um, uh, he holds postgraduate degrees from Fuller Theological Seminary and Loma Linda University. Myra, Myra Dakeba is the Refugee Congress Delegate for Virginia. And, and Myra, we invite you to tell me us more about the work of the Refugee Congress. Uh, she is a Karen human rights activist from Karen State Eastern Burma. She was an internally displaced person for nearly 12 years and a refugee for 17 years until she fled to the United States. She lost many of the people she knew, including but not limited to her own immediate family members, close relatives and close friends due to the oppressive torture and killing by the Burmese um, ironically named State Peace and Development Council troops. Myra became an active community organizer and human rights advocate when she was 13 years old. Over the past decade, she has engaged with various human rights issues in Burma, as well as serving Karen refugees in the US. She is the director of the US campaign for Burma and she is also founder of the Karen American Organization, now known as the Karen Organization of America, dedicated to working, educating, and empowering Karen communities across the US through meetings, conferences, leadership training, community building, and advocacy. She says that refugees are some of the most resilient people who overcome countless kinds of human rights violations. Through their suffering, they become stronger. Peter Carmen, Reverend Peter Carmen, 
is an American Baptist minister. Trained at Haverford College and Yale Divinity School, he has been an activist, organizer, and pastor since the 1980s. He was raised in India and Cambridge, Massachusetts. He has served multicultural urban churches most of his adult life. He presently serves as the consultant liaison with American Baptist churches, serving with American Baptist Home Mission Societies. He's partners with um, Afghan persons and uh, evacuees and refugees. And he's previously collaborated with refugees in settling, including receiving hundreds of refugees from Burma while a pastor in Rochester, New York. In addition to his work with ABHMS, uh, Peter writes songs, preaches, and recently completed a walk of the Camino de Santiago in Spain. So we welcome uh, the three of, of you in, in, your con in our conversation today and would like uh, Reverend Malave if you can begin. Thank you, Lisa, and, and greetings to all of you. Uh, so glad to see at least a couple of friends and colleagues here, Rotan and, and Jeff Hagri. Um, good to be with all of you uh, this afternoon. Um, thank you for inviting me and being in this space uh, this afternoon. Um, I'm, I'm so glad that Rotan, in, in, uh, obviously in her prayer, included the death of the uh, 51 uh, brothers and sisters in, in San Antonio, uh, which is something that is outrageous and, and unthinkable to, to feel the pain uh, of such a loss of so many souls, so many brothers and sisters of ours. Um, the, the reality is that the level of frustration and, and what I'm, the short three minutes I'm gonna speak is from, I'm, I'll speak from my perspective as Latino. I know that the immigration issue is more than Latinos, uh, but I, I'm speaking as a Latino here today. So the level of frustration we have uh, with our systems, particularly with our government, is huge. Uh, but at the same time, I, I think that that should not surprise us uh, we have seen played out uh, recently how uh, different uh, branches of our government um, does not, if we could say that, respect the will of, of the American people. Um, and, and this is an issue, the issue of immigration, where the American people has been clear, the vast majority of Americans uh, support reforming uh, our immigration laws. So it's not something that that uh, Congress or will have to think it through twice. It's something that it's clear, but we know. Uh, we know the level of, 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 of the vision that we have in our country and that is reflected um, in, in our Congress and, the, and the, the fact that they have not been able to come together to enact a, a reform of the immigration system that is so outdated. Um, let me just share this, this very briefly, and this is basically what I'm, I like to say. Um, we need to find, I mean, we are fighting against systems that are so um, inconsistent, systems that are so, in many ways, oppressive. Uh, that we need to build strong, strong coalitions to, to have at least a chance to fight against the inertia or the bad will, if we can call it, of, of systems, uh, including our government, including Congress. Um, and so we need to find ways to unite in our advocacy. We need to find ways to put aside minor the points and divisions that we may have and just rally behind a, a, a big idea. And I, I speak this by, by experience. I mean, even among our Latino community, we don't all agree necessarily on all the little points and dots on, on, on what it has to be done in immigration. But for the most part, uh, we, we can agree on the most important um, aspects of the change that our laws need. And, and so, and we have worked that out in our in our Latino community. Um, we still have some outliers. We will always have those. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we are kind of united. We have a united front. Um, and so what I will say is, again, we need to find ways to create stronger alliances 
among people of different um, um, eth ethnic backgrounds uh, and, and, and to present a, a, all the force that we can bring forward to particularly to Congress. Uh, let me just finish by saying that nobody knows what's gonna happen uh, on November elections. Uh, some people are for a while talking about, well, Republicans are coming back. Uh, we, who knows? We don't know. But regardless of who come back, if it's Republicans or if Democrats continue, we haven't had much luck with neither for the last many years. So that tells us what is the kind of, of push that we need to make, the alliances that we have to build in order to push for this that the American people as a majority has been asking for years and years. So I'll stop there. And again, thank you for the opportunity to, to talk today. I appreciate that introduction and, and anticipate hearing more from you, uh, Carlos. Myra, please. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, well, I'll give you a little bit about Refugee Congress formed in uh, 2011. Uh, Refugee Congress is a national uh, nonpartisan organization built and also led by former refugees like myself, asylum, asylum seekers and other uh, vulnerable immigrant, uh, migrants to promote the well-being and also the dignity of all the vulnerable um, immigrants. And so, yes, we spread ourselves out um, in the 50 states. And we do advocacy on the refugees, asylum issues, as well as um, migrant issues. And um, yeah, it's been pretty rewarding that we have the opportunity to speak up. Um, today, I um, I wanted to, uh, uh, I, I certainly agree with um, uh, Reverend Malvey. Um, and I wanted to add on a little bit in terms of the refugee side is that I'm pretty sure we all um, notice like the refugee resettlement um, enjoy the bipartisan support. So basically when it comes to refugee issues, um, both the, the Republican and the Democrat are quite um, cooperating, although they are not cooperating all the time the way we want it to see, but they are quite cooperating, especially when it comes to the situation where the Afghanistan and the Ukraine are in a really hard situation right now. And if we look back uh, uh, since 1980, uh, the US Refugee Admission Program has enjoyed uh, this opportunity and working together. And um, I think that's very important that we continue uh, working together in that sense, in welcoming the refugee and, uh, refugees, migrants, and the most uh, vulnerable um, immigrants. Um, but also at the same time, bear in mind that worldwide right now, we have about 79.5 million displaced people and uh, 29.6 million, they are the refugees. And those of those 40% are children. So which means that we have a ton of people who are needing um, help very badly and not just from Afghanistan and Ukraine, but many other countries across the world, including Burma. And why I'm saying that is that I also wanted to uh, bring to our intention as we do advocacy around uh, refugee resettlement or migrant issues, I also wanted to encourage all of us to uh, to, 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 to ask or to urge our officials that we need to raise the number of the, 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 the resettlement uh, people to resettle. So right now we're trying to advocate for having at least 200,000 uh, for the physical, physical year of 2023 uh, with fully um, funding uh, because a lot of times, whether we have the number of the resettle big or small, but also the, another problem is that we've seen at many different um, refugee agencies, they've been complaining about not having enough funding. And therefore um, the, the community, the refugee community that they have to serve um, 
they cannot serve the newly resettled um, to the capacity that they, they, they need to. And that is why while we incre uh, uh, advocating for the increasing number of the resettled uh, uh, persons, refugees, we also should uh, advocate for enough appropriate number of uh, um, yeah, funds. Um, but also at the same time, another one I wanted to touch on quickly is that uh, like we've heard earlier, another thing uh, we haven't, uh, we, we have been um, um, advocated a, whole, a lot about is also ending Title 42 for especially the situation that we are in right now. Well, before it was used to me for the past administration, I saw it as a, a political tool or maybe he also use it as uh, uh, health issues or economic issues or whatever that is. But which country in this world that managed to obtain vaccines the fastest and then get our people uh, vaccinated the fastest? The US is the country. So we shouldn't use COVID or uh, economic issues as a, as a way out, but instead take that off the list and take off the, Title 42 so that the people who get stuck and being treated unfairly have the opportunity to find their way to a safe place. Um, I'll leave it for now and we're going, uh, uh, we can interact later uh, through the uh, question and answer. Thank you. Thank you, Myra. Peter? Thank you, Lisa, for uh, uh, inviting me to share with you all. And uh, I, I'm, um, uh, I'm not going to sound too different on some things, uh, but I, I have a couple of specifics to add. Uh, first of all, um, let me take a moment to let you all know what I do. I'm, I'm pretty new to ABHMS, <clears throat> and I work as a consultant part time. But my job is to find uh, churches that are already working with the Afghan evacuees or are interested in doing that uh, and it is provoked by um, the uh, evacuation last summer and the situation of many, many people having been held in camps for a long time. That situation has eased on the camps front, has not eased in terms of people situation uh, as they're transitioning into a status that is not refugee. And I just need to say that one, the one, one thing I want to ask people to, uh, if you're calling your congressperson anyway, and even if you're not, call them and put the heat on about the Afghan Adjustment Act. There's no excuse. Uh, right now, you have to be, if you, if you got into the U.S. from Afghanistan, uh, you're safe for uh, two years tops. And uh, after that, there's no path to refugee status. There's a path to apply for asylum. That's not the same thing. And uh, as, as uh, Rotangi said to me recently, there aren't enough lawyers for the way it is right now. So um, the, the uh, other thing I want to uh, say is I'm anxious to, if your church or somebody you know is already working with Afghan evacuees, we'd love to be in touch with them. Uh, if they're interested in finding out more about how to do it and don't know where to start, happy to talk with them. Uh, it can be hard right now. Agencies are overwhelmed uh, generally and um, it's, it's not simple who you talk to. Um, Church World Service is our primary partner as in the ABC. They don't have offices everywhere and they do have a small program for working with churches outside their area. But um, so if I can be of help, please let me know. And um, I will, after I quit talking, I'll put my phone number and you can text me or call me. That's the, uh, the I'm really anxious to hear from you as well as uh, email. Um, the I think this is not immigration. This uh, this settlement of people is not immigration reform, right? It's the downstream response of Christians, and is not the upstream response. But it's the same stream. And I, I believe, as followers of Christ, we are compelled uh, both to reach out to individuals and families who are our neighbors, as well as to um, to to uh, work on structural change. That's why I've got a sign on my door that says in Arabic and in Spanish and in English that says anybody uh, is, uh, is welcome in this house. Um, the, uh, 
the the situation of co-sponsors that we were talking about some time back is now complicated by the fact that because of the sorts of things uh, that we were talking about earlier, their funding isn't there for agencies to continue support after people come in. And so whether they're Afghans or others, you get people who have limited support coming in uh, and don't have the kind of infrastructure of support uh, equally everywhere. And so you also have a whole, and, and many have been sponsored by agencies that don't have much community connection. So you we have lots and lots of people that need that uh, without uh, contact outside your own community, um, there you're going to be isolated, and the isolation is a killer. Um, literally, sometimes I remember a conversation with friends who were refugees a few years back. I asked, "How's the community doing?" It was the middle of the winter, and they said, "Not good, Pastor Peter. A lot of people are considering suicide." Enough said. Um, so uh, let me say that this, uh, just please make that phone call and then make it again. Um, because, um, uh, there's, it's not clear what's happening, but cause there's Republican sponsors. And I mean, we can't agree about anything in this country, but theoretically we agree about an Afghan adjustment act. Let me now just finish up by, um, talking not in my capacity as a worker for ABHMS, but as an American Baptist minister and a human being. Uh, the situation of our Afghan friends, uh, I believe, needs to be taken very seriously and is also part of that same larger picture that both of the previous speakers spoke to. And uh, it, it, I think we just need to be straightforward as Christians living in the United States saying, there is a xenophobic, hostile approach to immigrants and foreigners that's part of our national DNA and that is being fueled by very unprincipled people with very murky ends. And in, I don't know where to start. I, I, I commit my body, Carlos, to your coalition. Let me just say that right up front. If nothing else comes out of this meeting, uh, you have my body and my heart uh, and you can call on me. Um, but I believe we need to recapture that uh, biblical vision that Lisa spoke to at the beginning and also a faith-filled energy and passion uh, that is uh, our heritage as American Baptists in these regards. This is who we are, and we can't let ourselves be lulled or um, seduced or put, put to sleep by a national di dialogue that says this is impossible. I mean, I, uh, the other day my wife and I were talking about my work, and I said, Lynn, I feel like I'm tilting at very large windmills. You feel like you don't make any difference. But um, we can't be limited by that, and we need immigration reform. And if we're going to pull it together, though, we need to be fueled by uh, the, uh, we need to be filled by the uh, hospitality of Christ and the willingness to make sacrifice of Christ and the um, biblical commitment to the sojourner that's part of our Old Testament tradition. And uh, I'm not saying it doesn't matter who's reelected in this fall, but I, I just want to end by echoing what Carlos said before. Um, uh, not only do we have bad luck with both sides, um, but also they're not whom we serve as Christians. And they should be following uh, our lead as citizens and as residents, not vice versa. And so I think that means we got to like ramp it up, folks. And uh, do I know where to start? Not if we go issue by issue, but I think the Old and New Testament provide the vision to insist on that whole lot more passion and broader vision uh, in welcoming uh, the war survivor, the dislocated, the person who's been economically compelled. Uh, and, and then again, yeah, we not only do we need to support each other, but I commit to supporting you and I ask for the same uh, in building some kind of a, a broader coalition uh, that doesn't allow itself to be divided by the either or thinking uh, of our times. Thanks. Sorry to go on a little too long, Lisa. No, you did fine. Appreciate all of uh, the comments. So as I said initially, I, we do want to hear from uh, the community that's represented on the call and appreciate uh, all of you taking time and understand you're taking a time because this matters to you. 
uh, whether uh, personally or uh, because of your community. Is there anyone now? You are welcome to come off mute uh, if you have a question or comment you'd like to make. Oh, Jeff, I see Yeah, please. Sure, Thank hello, you. everybody. I, I, would, I would like to chime in. First of all, I wanna add my welcome to that shared already by Lisa. I'm Jeff Hagrey, Executive Director of the Home Mission Societies and very uh, thankful that we're having this uh, conversation today. Thank you, Carlos, uh, whom I've known for years. And thank you, Myra. And thank you, Peter. Uh, Peter and I go all the way back to the Divinity School many years ago. Uh, I'm much younger than he is, but we were at school around the same time. But <laughs> that's a joke in part, but uh, what he did. But I, I want to just uh, say to this issue of uh, immigration uh, and to those of us in the church, and I'm going to just put something out there that uh, by way of personal commentary and observation that is a concern for me as relates to our partner, Church World Service, and as we're advocating. I think, I think there's a need also to advocate the church world service because church world service is the go-to mainline denominational agency of the US State Department when they are working on relocating persons uh, and uh, including with the Afghan resettlement. Uh, and I think it is very important that church world service and other religious based organizations who are agreeing with the State Department to receive displaced persons, that at the time we agree to receive them, that we advocate for the most possible regarding their status, uh, for in the case of the Afghan refugees and the designation of parolees, which is not only an offensive, offensive language to use, but um, you know, my own, again, now is where I get into my own commentary, you know, our president uh, and our government was under a lot of, a pre lot of pressure as we were uh, evacuating from Afghanistan to not leave Afghans behind. And, uh, and, and so pledges were made that they would not do that. Uh, and and they did relocate many people. And for many of those that they relocated who were not in government service, and there are a lot of Afghans who were relocated through government channels who may presently be working for the government with the government on various things appropriately so. And it's not clear to me that they're called parolees. <laughs> but I think that the, in working, but they're all, but the vast majority or others uh, who were relocated through church world service were given a very unclear, uh, very temporary status. And where we have to be careful as people of faith and our eagerness to serve and to make a difference in human lives is we just take them, right? And that's the right thing to do. We take them. But we need to also understand, and just say this is church world service, and I've actually said this to the president directly of church world service. <laughs> uh, did you get the most that you, uh, each refugee should come with funds, that we are, we, we are a very wealthy nation and it has been proven, uh, it's being proven now in Ukraine when our president can by stroke of a pen uh, pledge $80 billion. I don't know how you can pledge $80 billion in one instance and not put dollars with refugees who resettle and rely completely on the generosity uh, and the goodwill of religious people to absorb uh, thousands of persons coming from a nation, but on the part of a nation that is spending billions of dollars for what it wants to spend. We are, we are finding billions of dollars, as well we should, I'm not condemning that, but our nation is finding billions of dollars to support the Ukrainian uh, campaign, self-defense campaign against Russia. But we can't put no, a few million dollars with uh, Afghans who have served us and so who have served the US, served alongside us and whom we are relocating. So there's a public relations campaign that, that our country carries on with, within the nation and oh, we're, bring, we're receiving Afghans. But an actual point of fact, if you are 
dropping off Afghans at the door of Church World Service, who was then calling upon the faith community to raise dollars to support these persons, and they have, and they come unaccompanied by any funds. <laughs> Not only are we uh, placing persons at the mercy of the goodwill of religious people, which we're we're always eager to do. But we're also disadvantaging persons because it's not in anybody's best interest to be 100% dependent on others for their food, water, clothing, and so forth. And these were persons who, were, who had jobs, who had careers, and so on. And if our public position, if the public position of our president and government was that we are relocating Afghans, we're doing right by Afghans, you don't bring them to the United States and drop them off at church doorsteps and then walk away. All I'm saying is that as we're, as we're writing letters of advocacy to our congresspersons, our senators, and so forth and so on. I think it's time we start writing the church world service because the government is talking to church world service. <laughs> the negotiations for the terms, for the status, and so forth and so on is being reached and it's being, we learned about the parolee status, did we not, Rotangi, through church world service. It's the first briefing we got. And how did they know? Because they met face to face with the State Department. And I said to State Department, to the uh, Church World Service, when you're talking to the State Department, <laughs> tell them to put some money with these refugees. Tell them to give them a status that is respectable. And so, so I'm gonna stop there. I'm not one of the presenters, but I'm just as we do our advocacy effort, let's make sure that on the front end and in an ongoing basis, the, the work of the State Department is not done until it does right by the, the person that it has relocated in terms of their status and with funding and so on. And I'll pause, I'll stop talking there. Thank you. There may be comments to what Jeff has just offered or others to anything you've heard yet today. Any questions or comments? Uh, George, uh, Hancock Stephens, you've come off mute to to make a comment? Sure. Um, yeah, as um, as one who <clears throat> who came through the uh, through the refugee camp when I was a young uh, person, um, I think there has been a time in which we, as a denomination, has had a much more impactful position um, because I know that at one point, and some of you may remember. Uh, Dr. Matthew Jufrida was a person whose office was entirely for refugee immigrants and resettlement. And within the ABC USA, we have reached a decision in which we have eliminated his office. Um, and, you know, I really appreciated what uh, Dr. Hagray said, but I think we have to start redesignated somebody who is going to be involved in this issue permanently and systematically so that the while right now the uh, other people are invited by the government the question is are we willing to create a position within the abc usa so we will be present at the discussion with the government will not be the third party i think that when um, when we had uh, uh, Matthew Jufrida, he was a part of the discussion between the government and all sorts of other offices. And I know that through his office at that time, there were thousands of people that have come and they were resettled in the United States. Our family being one of the many thousands that came. Um, if I can make some comment as well. Um, so I, I, I certainly agree. Um, so here we're talking about three different um, groups of people or, well, let's say, um, especially the, when, they, when the, both Afghanistan as well as the Ukrainian came in uh, with a parole status, which they're supposed to also have the access to funding so that for the first couple of years where they're trying to settle down, they, they, they have the mean to, to survive. But at this point for the Ukrainian, they don't really have uh, the designated pool of funding for, for them yet in the Congress. So basically Congress doesn't make that way yet. And also going back to earlier um, in terms of the refugee, 
So Rontan and I, we, we, we've known each other <laughs> at least a decade ago because of the refugee connection. So you'll see the refugees are coming in and they are expected to be self-sufficient in 90 days. I mean, think about who's going to be self-sufficient in 90 days in a country where you know nothing, let alone you don't even speak the language. And that is why there's a whole ton of issues. And um, I'm so appreciative of the, uh, the American Baptist churches and many other churches um, that come into play and supporting, trying to sort of like pick up um, the refugees where the, the, the agencies left off and trying to support them in many different ways. And that is why um, this is how many Burmese refugees uh, are and were able to get through. So in that sense, I wanted to say thank you so much uh, for the ABC community. Um, but at the same time, I also wanted to remind uh, all of us is that, yes, doing advocacy is tedious. We've been saying this over and over and over for how many years, but yes, we just have to continue saying it. We just have to continue asking for, otherwise those who need our, our help uh, will not get what they need. But also on the other hand, uh, I, I just also wanted to remind us that in any case, in doing any kind of advocacy on behalf of the refugees or the asylees or uh, uh, the vulnerable immigrants, it's also very important to include them in the conversation because they are the ones who have the first hand stories to tell and perhaps to sort of like to connect to, to help our uh, officials to connect with these people in a personal level. So or, yes, it, it'll be very beneficial if we can have connection with the resettle uh, communities or the refugee asylum communities. I'm pretty sure around us, one way or the other, if we step out, we're going to find one and probably you might find too many already. But um, in uh, yeah. I, all in all, I just wanted to say thank you so much, and uh, we just have to continue what we're doing. Thank you. Are there? Uh, I, yes, Christian, yeah. and then and then Juan. Qu uh, quickly, I just wanted to to speak just um, uh, from my perspective. I, I lead a very small nonprofit in Southern California, south of LA. And uh, thank you so much, Lisa, and for the presenters who are here and for all the work that you're doing, um, particularly on this macro level. It's incredible. Um, I don't necessarily even have a question, but it's just been kind of stirring in me just the perspective of someone who, we're an education-based nonprofit. We're not an advocacy nonprofit, but we primarily work with, um, with our, our Latinx immigrant neighbors. And um, this is a community that, has gotten so used to, to living so visibly, uh, just you know, from what I've seen over the years and having their families live invisibly under the radar, not wanting to ruffle feathers. And um, whenever there are opportunities within higher education, especially that may sound too good to be true, for example, like the uh, tuition-free community college, our, our own parents have been hesitant to take advantage of those things because they, they see that as certain measures to, to, to draw certain folks out and to become more known by more institutions. Um, my big struggle, and this is just a personal thing I'm sharing, but my big struggle as, as a director is, um, as a leader of this community, um, where is my place in terms of advocacy where over these last few years we've seen, especially with, with uh, such events such as such as ICE and there there have been raids in not in our communities thank God but in some local communities you know what what is my role in continuing to broaden the um, the community the wider community of, and bring them into the work that we're doing while also reconciling um, that bringing more people into our community may may in fact point put a target on our immigrant neighbor's backs and saying, showing people this is where our immigrant neighbors are living and, and, and working and breathing and all of that. 
Um, so that's just a struggle that I've experienced as, as someone who's wanted to be an advocate, but as someone who knows that I represent a very small community and being too loud in some ways might inadvertently um, harm um, some of our neighbors that we serve. So again, I have no question, um, but um, it was just stirring in me because that's sort of one of the perspectives that I think um, are also probably across the country. Christian, I value that uh, comment, that struggle, that tension that you're raising. I have it, I, I'm, I'm holding that question, that comment, though you say it's not a specific question because I would like to hear the reflection of others about that. Uh, and I'm sure others at the table would as well. It's a place, let me place it uh, on the table. And Juan and Allison, I saw both of you come off of mute. Your comment or question may not relate to what Christian has just offered, that's that's okay if it doesn't. But it's a, we'll come back to what Christian has has offered for the for the larger table because I do want to hear from Juan and then from Allison. Again, if the comments or questions are not related to what you've previously heard, that's fine. We'll figure out ways to come back to them. Thanks, Juan. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. I just want like I have been working with a group here in, in Chicago. Um, and one of the issues about migration that I think is we are in the United States taking it too narrowing in the sense that this is not an issue only on migration. This is a religious issue about fundamentalists taking over. Uh, this is an ideological issue, white supremacy. This is an, a political issue about partisan uh, politics in the United States. And this is an economic issue, cheap labor. And I think if we don't, we can try to do all this kind of advocate for if we don't have a holistic uh, approach to this issue, we are going to keep doing this forever. I have started this when I was here at the first time in Chicago in 1983. And I have been feeling that we are practically in the same place when I started in 1983. Uh, because I think we are not getting, a complete picture of the issue. I know that is more difficult. I'm not saying I'm not saying that, but we need to be conscious uh, uh, of that. I just want to make a point, and I'm going to do it now as a pro weekend. We are taking a lot of issues about uh, migration, but I would like you to know, and I hope that you know, that it's a big internal displacement of pro weekend to United States, and the issue is about land. The land has been sold. It's been sold right now for many people. The buying a house in Puerto Rico is, of anyone is almost impossible at this time. People are leaving Puerto Rico because they cannot uh, pay electricity and water and food, and they cannot even, even pay rents in the houses. That's mean that is an, another way of talking about migration. Yes, we are US citizen and all that crap. For me, I'm just, not going to go over there, uh, if, uh, but uh, I think it's an issue and this become an international issue. We have a political uh, politics of, uh, it's a lot of fun to send to Honduras and El Salvador to uh, strength the military and the police, but they are not giving any money to people who come who need to, those, that money. I think it's very complicated, uh, but we just need to, to be very conscious about uh, the web of issue who, who is around the uh, migration issue. Thank you. May, may I ask a follow-up question of, uh, 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 of my friend Juan? Uh, and what, what, do you, what, is the rash, what is the reason for that you said increase? Is there some other associated developments, land grabbing or developers? They are, that, they, are, that are accounting for that. What is there are the, two? There are two laws, the law twenty two and law twenty four, who allow to people, uh, rich million people, to come to a country and buy land without paying any taxes. Uh, they even sometimes they can get free water and free electricity uh, if they hire two or three people as workers. Uh, that is uh, that is one issue. And that's, that grabbing of land has made expensive some of the, of, of the areas in, in Puerto Rico, making it more difficult for Puerto Rican to be there. 
and they are buying a lot of uh, the hotel and trying to buy the beaches. That is that is happening right now, and that's part Did of. Did this happen post Hurricane Maria, or was it the case prior to that? Well, the I would not say that it started before Maria, but after Maria, because everything got worse, many people needed to leave, and that's when it become more easy to grab some other stuff. Uh, but yes, I have to say, and I'm and I can and I can say you with certainty because I was working in the Congress in Puerto Rico about this, and this started at least uh, 10 years ago. It just, after Maria, was easier about the conditions to go to all this, uh, what someone called the chaos economy uh, in that sense. Thank you. I'm sorry, Juan, what kind of economy do you call it? Uh, crisis or chaotic economy, that's, uh, 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 yeah, that's, mm -hmm. That's the way that they, they have been doing it in the last, uh, I would say, five or six years in Puerto Rico. Sure, and and a similar reality uh, to you know, the question and the timing, a similar reality occurred in New Orleans uh, uh, beyond, behind Katrina of who was then able to per repurchase or purchase uh, the land, disaster capitalism. Yes, Allison. Okay, Allison, you had a, a, a question or comment, but thank you particularly, Juan, as you made an effort to to, to weave together all of the issues, that this is not an immigration issue. And I, I think so much of our struggle in advocacy uh, is around trying to um, uh, separate uh, issues uh, from each other that are very much related to each other. So- Yeah, um, I, no, that, yeah and to that point uh, uh, that you're making, Lisa, so it is a human migration issue. Uh, in the sense that human migration is caused by varieties of things. In this case, to use Allison's term, disaster capitalism. Uh, we're most familiar with wars, um, you, you know, injustice, forced labor, the kinds of things we've seen in Myanmar or in Afghanistan or Ukraine. But uh, human migration is also caused by environmental issues and the soil and whatever, and disasters. And in this case, uh, capitalism whether it is disaster capitalism or if it predates the disaster, as Juan said, in the case of Hurricane Maria, they all result in people leaving home, relocating, wandering from one place to another, showing up at, our, at the church, at the doorsteps of the church, uh, asking for provisions, uh, violence as we see in parts of Latin America, South America, and so on. So all of these, so diverse factors contribute to human migration. And so, and we are more at risk, we are very much at risk in the United States of America at not attributing equal, assigning equal weight to migrants who are uh, relocating due, on the move due to capitalism and violence and political displacement as we are to persons from very, very far away shores. So they're all uh, deserving of our attention, but yeah, it's very real. Allison, please. Um, uh, so I think the area of the web of issues we're talking about that I've been most directly involved in is um, challenging the growth of detention centers. Uh, the United States has over 200 detention centers. So we're the largest, we're the country with the largest detention center. 80 of them are um, run by for-profit companies. And what does it mean uh, very specifically with our prophetic call to release the captives um, who are in detention solely because they do not have paperwork. It's a civil infraction, not even a criminal infraction, and they can waste away in there for years. And um, I've been doing a lot of work both to release people in detention and to advocate for uh, shutting down detention centers, primarily in California. But I was very curious if uh, folks are addressing issues of uh, detention and um, the, this, the immigration prisons uh, and the growth of that and, um, and the, the ways in which people are um, uh, being forced to work for, for slave wages, particularly uh, so that companies can profit. And that's just uh, if if anyone is connected to any of this or uh, ways in which I could partner with, provide education for, et cetera. I'm I'm very passionate about that. That's good. No, so this is a case where 
you know, Allison has shared with us uh, her passion, uh, what she's working on. And, uh, and that's, that's what we want more of. Allison would be good if you haven't done so already. You know, maybe share the name of your organization if you have a website or your email address or how people others can contact you. Uh, because that's one of the things, that's one of the goals of these justice dialogues to uh, make us all uh, better aware of what each, each other is doing and, uh, and, and, and to see the intersections. And so, um, so, so that, that's very important to share. Thank you. I'm sorry, Carlos, did I, yeah, did I see you raise your hand? Yeah, just a brief comment. Um, hammering again on, <laughs> on this passion of mine of, of, um, of building coalitions and coming together. Uh, I, I'm, I am hopeful, yeah, particularly in regards to the issue of immigration, that eventually we will, we will break through um, in, in the next, I don't know, year or so. Or, um, I, I can tell you just in a second, um, there is, I have a friend of mine who, who is a young um, uh, evangelical, and obviously, again, I work with evangelicals and, 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 and mainline, so I work with people from all the spectrum, um, politically and theologically. And so this fellow, uh, young, young um, man in Florida, he is um, teaching um, mostly Pentecostals and evangelicals about uh, advocacy and social justice. Um, and he's making inroads uh, in Florida. Recently, about a month and a half ago, he brought 250 uh, Pentecostal leaders to Tallahassee uh, to advocate uh, before the, 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 the legislators and even the governor uh, DeSantis on, on the um, racial uh, race, how, how would I say that, on, on the laws that, that the, the, the houses in, in, in Florida, the, the legislators wanted to pass uh, regarding uh, migrant shelters caring for unaccompanied minors. Um, and, and so the, these were Pentecostals who came uh, with a clear uh, perspective on, on, on the racism behind this loss that are happening all over the country, particularly in Florida on this issue. They didn't want uh, the Santis uh, sign uh, the letter that, that the legislators in, in, in Florida uh, voted for. But it, it, was, it was unprecedented, the fact that 250 uh, Pentecostal pastors came to Tallahassee to advocate. So, I mean, sometimes, obviously, uh, we, feel, we feel very discouraged on other issues. We just saw that <laughs> this last couple of weeks. But that doesn't deter me from continue working on, on other issues that, that, that we can gain inroads. This is one. Thank you. So we did have a question earlier uh, that uh, Pastor Eric Hoheisel put in the chat around uh, his, his comment. Uh, uh, Eric, go ahead and offer it, please, if you can. Just come off mute and offer it. Well, I just had um, heard some things anecdotally about uh, guest worker programs in Canada and some success there in the way that their laws are put together. And I just wondered if anybody could tell me or point me to anything that would say that's, that would work in the United States or not, or if, if you could just point me in the direction of a resource where I could read more about uh, that approach and whether it's viable in the United States or not. I believe the United States has guest worker programs in the summertime. Um, and it usually attracts a lot of Europeans, Eastern Europeans who come um, like from Poland, those countries, and they work um, across the country, various places, mostly like hotels and restaurants. Yeah, and uh, there's been reports in the news recently regarding what uh, Ratangi is sharing now. Uh, guest worker programs are have been in place in the U.S. for some time, primarily in the hospitality industry. Uh, when you go to resorts and beaches and pools, a lot of the young people that you see working are actually not Americans. They are in guest worker programs. What's been in the news earlier this summer, uh, this earlier this year, 
was that those programs are really strained right now. Uh, uh, Post pandemic, uh, inflation, travel costs, uh, hiring with companies. Uh, you'll, you'll see that even in this area where we are in, uh, in Philadelphia, not far from the Jersey Shore, uh, a lot of folks in the hospitality industry are reporting that they're understaffed. Uh, why are they understaffed? They're understaffed because uh, the, the challenges associated with many of the guests, they have traditionally looked to the guest worker programs, but those guest worker programs are not primarily designed for uh, migrants or persons who are migrant workers. Uh, they're primarily, uh, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I've always thought about it as cheap labor for the U.S. or not wanting to really uh, hire kids from the inner cities. But it's 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 described much more elegantly than that by those who do them. Uh, but the but there those programs have been under some stress right now to find guest workers uh, due to the pandemic, travel, violence, and a number of the the travel industry and so on. And the guest workers program, uh, agree with everything that that being said. It's one of the elements that people who are working and advocating for immigration reform that should be seriously considered. Uh, enhancing those programs and making those, those programs more just, more fair, uh, and more available to people. In the time that's remaining, and, and we have about, uh, about 10 minutes, um, uh, I just wondered, uh, so I'd like us, if we could, to just revisit um, the comment uh, that uh, Christian raised if there are particularly others in this community that can speak to what he raised, whether in agreement or response uh, around uh, what's effective, what's an effective way to advocate uh, in a way that does not expose uh, a vulnerable population to greater harm. Lisa, I have, um some distant experience with similar issues uh, around um, exposure of people in, in sanctuary uh, programs and uh, also questions about advocacy around Burma at a point before uh, I was in quite a while back. Uh, and there was a lot of uh, discussion in the ABC about how much should we be saying anything publicly about Burma because we would be endangering Baptists in Burma. That's that's the analogy uh, that comes to mind. Uh, I found um, every time this subject has come up, I don't know if this is helpful or not, Christian, but but the um, uh, thing that's been important for me to do is to uh, get with people who are at risk and uh, make that decision, let them have a powerful voice in making a decision about how loud I'm gonna be or not. And I'm often surprised by the results I'm often surprised by the results of that. And I'm often surprised by the results of allowing people to find their own voices and speak for themselves, but to help them uh, with uh, the equipment for being heard. So th those are the thoughts that come to me uh, is sometimes about getting myself out of the way and my worry and letting, so that there's a place for the meeting of the real worries of the real people who are engaged. It doesn't mean that you know, nobody's going to get hurt. But at least it means that there's more voices uh, than mine in terms of making the decisions about what I'm going to do. So so I guess, you know, Quakers talk about having discernment committees. Uh, I, I think that's one way to, to do it is to, to get help from the people, other people who are going to be affected by the action uh, and who are going to be put at risk by my actions. Thank you, Peter. I see, I see several have come off mute, but let me ask Carlos first, because he, he just had his hand raised. And then um, I, I see George and Allison and, and Juan have also come off and we want to make time for your comments. Yeah, thank you, Lisa. Something that is critical, particularly for the Latino community, may apply to other communities, but it's particularly the Latino community, is the low level of involvement in advocacy uh, that our people have. Um, and it, let me give you just, just a very quick example. I'm, I'm working with uh, some African-American uh, brothers and sisters on a project on voting rights. 
and we're working on 10 particular key states. And, and I, I will, I'm part, part partnering with them, and I promise to find Latinos and Latinas who will be part of this voting rights effort. It's so difficult that people don't want to get involved. Uh, they don't see the need to get involved and the power that they would have if they get involved. So in our particular, particular Latino community, we need to keep educating, educating and educating our people about the need to get involved and, and exercising the power that they have. Most of our people are not trained to be involved in the political process. Uh, because the places where they come, they're not involved in the political process, but here we need to educate our people. And George? Um, I just wanted to say that when I lived in um, uh, Chicago, we had uh, people who came here um, legally and we had people here who were an extended visa, either because they came as friends or whatever other th situations. I did find out that whenever I took those people to the immigration naturalization, all of them were, quote, shipped out of the US really quickly. Um, and so I found out that the immigration naturalization does not extend visa and is not very kind to people who are seeking for an extension of visa. And so they are sent back very quickly. Uh, to the point of uh, th that there's not any promise that, that people won't get hurt um, in, in these efforts. Um, but um, is, is there any, Juan, a comment? Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, what Peter said is you know, always important that people make their own decision how risk, how much risk they want to take. The other issue is uh, it's important we have done that is we are not trying one person to take the risk. We can find two or three people who are willing to take the risk, and then it will be make a stronger uh, call, and also will be stronger for them to feel each other. The other thing that we do is we make sure that they understand uh, what can happen, and we will provide lawyers or whatever they need, and that they can have some confidence that whatever they happen, we are going to walk with them uh, the, whole, the, whole, the whole way. And I think that's. In a way, something about the involvement of political process, uh, Carlos, that I think that's really important. It's not only about experience, uh, but also about theology. Uh, that's the issue that I found in my church. People do not want to get involved because that not a spiritual, that is not Christian, that is not biblical, whatever you, you wanted to put it uh, that way. It's not only because they come from a military or detectorship experience, it's just they don't believe in that theologically. And that is becoming a big, big challenge uh, for the Hispanics uh, above all. Thank you. And again, in the few minutes, uh, oh, okay, I see Ritang, uh, is, was there something you wanted to offer? I see your hand of agreement, uh, but please, if there's something you wanna share. And um, can you please, as we continue the conversation, if if you want some more kind of engagement in this, and we'll figure out some ways of even connect, connecting you, Carlos has put his contact information and others have, please in the chat, though of course you've registered for this event, but if you want to have an ongoing conversation about uh, this matter of, of human migration, please just uh, put a quick name and comment uh, and uh, contact uh, email in the chat so that we can continue to follow up. Uh, Ratangi, please. Mm -hmm. I, yes, I'd like to make several points. Um, one to the issue of um, um, not wanting to be advocate, uh, uh, to be out there advocating. And, and I know it, uh, we've faced that same issue in the Asian community, but I think the second and third generation are a lot more outspoken. And I think the last few years of experience of racism sort of really brought out people uh, about the need for advocating for themselves. And, um, and, and that there was no one else who was going to speak up for them, but they had to do it for themselves. And I think that sort of woke up the, the Asian American community, particularly you know, during COVID. Um, and so we've seen a lot more activity there. But, um, during the first um, generation, there's uh, usually people are very hesitant because they've often come from 
uh, countries where uh, governments have been very authoritarian and if they spoke up, you know, it usually meant they would get killed or targeted. And so there's a lot of uh, fear of the government, of anybody in authority. And so you often have to advocate and let them know that it's this is a free country, you can speak. But um, as a minority, you also know that you don't always get treated the same, even if you do. Um, so, so there's that issue. Um, about the migration issue, uh, human migration, and there's just one point I want to make. It's particularly as it uh, concerns um, the migrants coming from Central America, um, and and the the issue that most people don't talk about. I mean, they're being seen as um, economic migrants, but what is not talked about is the the uh, the the trade policies of the U United States that has caused uh, economic upheaval in many in many Central American countries um, the NAFTA trade you know where the U S dumped all the corn uh, so that the farmers were not able to sell their own corn and um, uh, at a cheaper price that means the United States dumped a lot of goods there uh, agricultural goods that was priced lower than what the farmers could grow. And so that left them um, um, not being able to sell any of their products. And so it left them um, uh, basically powerless uh, without any money. And so they had to seek, go place, you know, other places. They had to migrate in order to find another way of making an income. So. Uh, the, the, so the, it's, the human migration is related to so many things. As we said, there's a web. It um, it's, um, it's, has to do with, the, of course, our drug policy is one that has caused a lot of that um, upheaval in south of the border. Um, there are disasters. And of course, there's the economics of it, too and how the United States has played a, a larger role in causing that upheaval and uh, the, the forced migration in south of the border. And, and I think the, the more we can explain to people the reason why people are migrating or leaving their homes, I think it, it, it also allows people to have a better understanding of why they had to leave their own country because that's not their, uh, most people do not, decide on a whim to leave their country and go through such hardships to try and come to the United States, uh, putting their lives in danger. Um, and then the other part thing I wanted to talk about was the, uh, the with regards to the refugee resettlement, um, it has gone through many phases. I remember when I first started working with refugees, they used to get government funding for a period of two years, and then it got cut down to a year and then six months, and now it's like 90 days. And so I think we really need to speak up more and ask the government to, to provide, the, because they have done it in the past and they can do it again and at least extend it to a year um, at, the, at the very least. Um, it puts a lot of strain in families and I know it um, also causes a lot of, um, difficulties um, in the communities as well, particularly those communities that are not able to adjust as quickly and have language problems. Um, and um, so the, there are the 19 resettlement agencies. Those are the ones that the government mainly talks to and the church will serve as one of those. Uh, but we can definitely push our own um, Congress people to put more funding it is usually put it in the budget um, um, in October when the Congress makes the budget for the year and it's allocated in that budget. So we need to advocate for more funding for refugee resettlement as well. So I our time today, mm -hmm. and Ratangi, you've put your contact information also in uh, the, the uh, chat, please. 
Okay. Uh, as we're coming to the end of, of today, thank you again for your, partic your active participation in the conversation. Uh, we've captured in the chat uh, those who want to continue in, in conversation with each other um, about uh, this particular matter. Uh, I appreciate you, Beverly, for including the link for uh, Space for Grace. That's an opportunity for us to have a face-to-face, -face, uh, just not a conversation generally with each other uh, um, and um, uh, not about this matter specifically, but just to be together in, in, uh, in Kansas City. Uh, you saw earlier for those who joined and, and uh, Bev, if you are able, you can bring, share again that particular slide uh, round space for grace. We hope you can join us there. Registration, early bird registration actually closes tomorrow. If you can uh, just uh, make an effort to register, that would be great. I've asked uh, uh, Pastor uh, Jaime Flores uh, if he will offer the closing prayer. If there be no other comments, let me just give a moment. Is there any other comment that this community wants to offer before uh, Pastor Flores offers the closing prayer? Okay, hey, uh, Pastor Flores, please. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for giving us the, this great opportunity to speak about issues among our immigrants from around the world. We will continue asking you, Lord, bless them in every situation that they are facing in this moment. Te doy gracias, Padre, por la oportunidad que nos das de de platicar acerca de situaciones que conciernen a nuestros inmigrantes refugiados en todo el mundo. Te pedimos que continúes bendiciéndoles en cualquier situación que ellos se enfrenten. In Jesus' name, we ask you. Amen. God bless you, everybody. Amen. Amen. Bendiciones a todos y a todas. Amen. Amen. Uh, we'll stay online for a moment for those who might want to offer their uh, contact information in the chat. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Take care, Christian. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thanks for joining us for Tony. Uh, glad to see you always. Same year, I think we've had a good conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, and I'm confident people want ongoing engagement on this, mm -hmm. uh, on this issue. So we'll figure out a way uh, to facilitate that. And appreciate you even, Carmen, and I think even Carlos, they're just, just being able to share information with each other. Mm -hmm. um, 